Hi, Govan, and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and lately I've been doing a lot of content that's been connected with Tolkien's faith. I've done a video about the fall of man and how he incorporated that idea into the tale of Adonel. I've done, at the request of a patron, a video on the idea of demon possession, which is a thing that Tolkien would have probably believed in as a Catholic. And it seems kind of logical to continue the trend and keep talking about his faith, but this time I'm going to go in a slightly less depressing or scary direction uh, and do something a little more uplifting, which is the idea of how providence uses people and makes things turn out all right. And specifically, the way in which providence tends to use the small, the weak, the, you know, the, the kinds of people that in the worldly sense, we would tend to ignore as being unimportant. And this is a very, very strong theme in Christianity, and Tolkien very clearly uses this theme in his own stories. So, I want to start by looking at Frodo as kind of the paradigmatic example of this, because he... I mean, it, it's the most explicit one we have, pretty much. And then branch out and explore a little bit some of the other examples and counterexamples. And by counterexample, I don't mean something that would prove the, the theme wrong so much as the converse situation. Somebody who is not weak, not small, not unwise, but nevertheless fails miserably. You might have an idea of what I'm getting at there. Uh, before I even get to it. But let's start with Frodo and set up what we're looking at here. So the first point to make here is, in terms of the Christian theming of this, there's many quotes in the Bible where God talks about putting uh, the wisdom of the wise to shame by using the foolish of the world. So God chooses the foolish to shame the wise. He chooses the weak to defeat the strong and all this sort of thing, and there are more explicit examples uh, and quotes than that. One of the ones that really occurred to me recently and that sparked the idea for this video is in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing a second time to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about something that a lot of people theorize is a uh, a, a problem with his eyes. He probably has vision problems at some point in his life. But he's saying that he has, he's been given visions and to keep him from becoming too proud and arrogant about the things that he's been, you know, the things that have been revealed to him, he was given a thorn in the flesh. And it's not 100% clear what this is, but there are other verses in the Bible that seem to indicate that maybe he had vision problems because he tells the church in Galatia in the letter to the Galatians that, you know, if it were possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. Seems like maybe he, you know, might have vision problems. And so maybe that's what he's talking about. So that's one theory, but nobody knows for sure what he's talking about. The point, though, is that this thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, was given to him so as to keep him from becoming too proud about the really, pr presumably just mind-blowing things that he had had revealed to him because he talks about you know, being, he talks about a man that he knew, which again, the theory here is that he's talking about himself, had been taken up either in body or in spirit to the third heaven and been shown things that just are not utterable. So, presumably he's talking about himself here, and he's talking about visions that we don't even know what he's talking about. He says they're unutterable. We don't even, he can't tell us what he saw. <laughs> so, you know, he's being treated in a very special way, and therefore that might tend to induce pride in a fellow, right? So, to prevent this, he was given a thorn in the flesh, and Paul says that he prayed to God to have this taken away from him, and God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's one of those really interesting kind of paradoxical things about Christianity is, you know, Christi Christianity is full of seeming paradoxes, like the fact that the, you know, God and Savior of the world would come to earth and die to save sinners. That seems completely backwards, and yet that's what, it, what happened, uh, according to the Christian faith. So, 
things like that are just abundant if you pay attention, and this is a specific example of that. Now, in the letter to the first Corinthians, there's also similar language about, you know, the the whole weakness and power thing, but it's not that specific element of Paul. It's more of the general statement, kind of like I gave earlier, about God using the weak to defeat the strong. And in fact, Tony Mead on Twitter post, posted a quote from 1 Corinthians, and he matched it up with the line that Gandalf is given in the Rings of Power section of the Silmarillion, where he says something that's very parallel to that about, you know, sometimes the weak have to do these things because the strong can't. And Elrond says something very similar in the Council of Elrond. So there's a bunch of language that's parallel to this whole idea in the Lord of the Rings. And this is where our, you know, our first parallel really comes into play here. Frodo, of course, ends up being the one who takes up this quest that Elrond has already hinted in the Council of Elrond may be assigned to, you know, somebody who is weak, or maybe he actually says it in the context of Frodo having just said it. I may be getting my timing mixed up. But at any rate, there is very clearly a an idea here that there's... A, he also, at one point, Elrond says the weak could attempt this with as much chance of success as the strong, because it's basically impossible anyway. Which is probably not encouraging, <laughs> but but that's kind of the, you know, the idea. And whenever it comes down to picking the last two members of the Fellowship as well, Elrond is like, I need to consider these last two. And Merry and Pippin are like, what are you talking about? We're going. And he's like, I don't know if I like that idea. I, I kind of want to send you back to the Shire, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen if you both go. And Gandalf says... We might be better to trust to friendship than than to great wisdom here, because even if you sent Glorfindel, somebody you know who is you know one of the more capable and powerful people that he could possibly send, he still couldn't storm the gates of the Barat Dur or the Black Gate of Mordor or scale the mountains for you. So you know what's the point? This also goes to a point that is. <sighs> related to other arguments and things, like, why wouldn't you send Glorfindel? He might be a little too obvious. Why wouldn't you fly the Ring to Mordor on the back of an eagle? Because you can see them. So there's a they, there's a sense here in which the whole weakness of the plan is precisely its value. And we can see this kind of mirrored in the movie, because when Pippin is trying to convince Treebeard to, you know, do something about Isengard, and they fail, of course... In the movie, he says, no, turn around, take us south. And Treebeard's like, that'll take you right next to Isengard. And he says, exactly. But, you know, he won't notice. And the closer we are to danger, the farther we are from harm. It's the last thing he'll expect. But in the book, it's actually stated kind of explicitly. It's like Gandalf says, our foolishness will be our cloak. Sauron weighs everything to a nicety in the scales of his malice. In other words, Sauron has thought of everything. And he considers this idea so stupid that he would never think that we would pick it. And therefore, it's the last thing he'll expect, and it'll make it easier for us to accomplish. Now, the point of the argument here is not to say that the weak things defeat the big things because the big things just think that the weak is not worth worrying about, and then the weak sneak up on the strong and win. That's not the point. But it is kind of parallel to the point. Now... The weakness of Frodo is stated rather explicitly by himself in Bag End when Gandalf is telling him about what the ring is and what needs to be done with it. Frodo at one point will say, why was I chosen? Like, he's just kind of despairing. Like, why have I been put in this impossible situation? Uh, and Gandalf says, you could be sure it's not for any merit of your own that is not possessed by others, but, you know, not for any great strength or wisdom or anything like this. But... Nevertheless, it's in your lap, and you have to use what, what heart and wits you have uh, to accomplish the goal. And Frodo says, but I have so little of any of these things. You're powerful. Why don't you take the ring? And Gandalf, of course, says, no. You know, <laughs> the temptation to use it would be too great. So this right here is where we start getting into the real meat of the thing, I think. Because Gandalf's argument for having Frodo do it and not taking it himself is partially, 
I will be tempted to use this ring to do things that you know, are good, but the use of the ring will corrupt me and it will all turn to evil in the end. And this is the parallel to Paul, what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians, because Paul is basically saying, yes, I've been given all this stuff, and that would probably have made me a really proud, arrogant person because nobody else has, you know, that kind of revelation, and it makes me feel really special. But to keep me from becoming too proud, I was given, you know, problems that made me feel like I wasn't quite so special. <laughs> that That's kind of what he's saying. And Gandalf, of course, is not talking about, you know, being dampened or anything by the Valar or whatever to, to make sure that he doesn't feel more powerful than he is, but it is a parallel type of idea. It's like, if he had the ring... He would be tempted to use it to basically magnify his own power and achieve things that he could not achieve on his own, whereas what he really wants to do is let providence kind of take control. And I think that is really the key here. The reason God uses the weak to you know, put to shame the strong, the wise, all of this, is because with weakness comes a certain amount of innate humility a lot of the time. Whereas with strength comes a lot of innate pride and arrogance. And humility lets providence work its own thing out in its own way. A humble person lets God work out his own plan his own way. A strong, wise person thinks, I can do this on my own, and therefore usually ends up working against providence. Because as Another place in the Bible says, and this is not exactly in the same vein, but it says, you know, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. In other words, God is so much wiser than everybody on earth that what we come up with as the smartest thing is still completely dumb by comparison. So even the smartest people in the world could look at something, try to come up with a solution, and it would pale in comparison to what God's solution would be. So, the reason the weak are used is because they are precisely the ones who are more likely to let themselves be used. They are the ones who trust to providence to make things, you know, turn out right, rather than trusting to their own strength to make things go their own way. And this, you know, we could see this happen in the story multiple times. Frodo, you know, he ends up having to trust to Gollum, thinking that, you know, I don't know of a way in. Gollum's been to Mordor. He can show us a way. And so, or through the marshes, or, you know, whatever it is, Sam, of course, has a lot of distrust on that. And, of course, Sam is arguably the example par excellence of, you know, being the small, weak, you know, not wise type of person. But he, he does have a wisdom of his own in some ways. But the point here is, Frodo trusts to Providence in a lot of ways, as does Gandalf. Gandalf is like, you know, I think Gollum has a part to play. I just don't know what it is. But he's constantly being receptive to the idea that there is a plan, even if he can't see it, and he's willing to let it kind of have its own way. Which makes you wonder if it was a good thing that Gandalf got separated from the company in Casa Doom, because if he had been with Frodo... Would they have ever gone to Kirith Ungol? We know that he thought the idea was a really bad one when he's talking to Denethor and Faramir, but how would he have gotten into Mordor? Excellent question. Gollum gets them into Mordor because Frodo is just kind of trusting to basically Providence. Not He's never explicit, but what else is there? It's like, you know, he does mention the fact that he thinks that they were probably destined to meet, and now that they have met, it's like, well... I've got to trust to what I've got, and that means trusting Gollum, and that's, you know, whether he thinks of it consciously in those terms or not, is trusting to Providence. So, this whole idea of Frodo being willing to kind of go with the way that the story is pushing him, rather than trying to make a way for him to get to the end of the story, in a metaphorical sense, is why the plan works at all. Because if he hadn't done that, something probably would have gone horribly wrong. And that's not to say that things don't go horribly wrong. Gollum, of course, betrays Frodo and all of this. But 
it's still because of Gollum that they got into Mordor at all, and otherwise they probably wouldn't have. And we can see this in a lot of different ways, and, you know, Aragorn also trusts a provenance, and I should mention here that Aragorn, of course, is not small, he is not weak, and he is not unwise. But this is where there's an interesting, let's say, uh, semi-parallel, because Aragorn does have his own self-doubts. He's got his own thorn in the flesh, you might say. He's got, you know, in some cases, really cr almost crippling self-doubt after Gandalf is gone, and he's like, every decision I make is horrible. And it's when he ha finally decides to chase after Merry and Pippin rather than Frodo and Sam, he says, my heart speaks clearly at last. And I think what he's what we're really being told is he's kind of following Providence and not, you know, trying to just think everything out on his own. It's when he, as a person who is, as Gandalf says, got his own wisdom and, and can, you know, take his own counsel, when he, as that person, decides, you know, I'm not going to try to just make all the smart decisions and make all this work myself, but rather just kind of listens to what he thinks just has to be the right thing to do, that's when it starts working out a little bit better. So there is a sense in which, you know, the strong can be in the same position as the weak, but they have to kind of let go of their own strengths and just rely on providence rather than their own wisdom, strength, whatever it is. So it's not just the fact that, you know, God will pick the weak. That is true in, in, the, in, in the principle of the thing, but that's not to say that God never picks anybody who is strong or wise, but that person has to realize what they are. And, you know, you can make this parallel to Paul, too, because Paul was a well-educated, well-trained person. You know, he will say things that talk about this occasionally, and he'll say that, you know, he was raised from, like, a kid to be a really, really educated theologian, basically. And so it's not like Paul was an absolute nobody, you know, but that's why he had to be given that thorn in the flesh to make him rely on providence. And you could say the same thing about Aragorn. Gandalf, of course, is also not weak, but he has been weakened in the sense that he has been put into a mortal body, which, you know, kind of dampens his power level in a sense. But also it's just the... the wisdom and humility that he carries with him as opposed to Saruman who on the opposite end of this spectrum he thinks that he is smart enough that he can do everything on his own and this gets back to what I was saying earlier about the reason that strong people don't tend to be in this mold is because they tend to become arrogant and think they can do everything their way and that's the trap that Saruman falls into he loses his reliance on providence, or in Tolkienian terms, we might say Estel. He loses his Estel and decides, I'm going to do this my own way. And that means I'm going to go find the ring for myself so that I can just beat down Sauron and then I'm going to you know, do, make Middle-earth work the way I think it's supposed to work. Which is why when he sees Gandalf, he says, knowledge, rule, and order are you know, the, the, the higher purposes, which is like, okay, knowledge, not good in and of itself. Order, not good in and of itself. You can have tyranny and have order. You can have knowledge and do a lot of bad things with it, right? And then rule, that almost sounds like tyranny. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just like order, but taking another step in the wrong direction, maybe. So Saruman has lost sight of what the actual ultimate good is, and he is thinking in his own terms. And it's very Sauronian terms at that, because what we know about Sauron is he had this idea for how to organize Middle-earth, let's say, in a way that would be like perfectly efficient, and this would be the best way to do it. And so that's why he wants to do what he wants to do. It's why he allies with Morgoth. It's in order to achieve what he thinks is the best vision for Middle-earth, and as a result, he goes completely down the wrong path. Saruman, you know, follows him down basically the same path, tries to obtain the ring, and when he doesn't, things go really badly. <laughs> but the main point is, Saruman goes wrong precisely because 
he's the smartest, he's the, you know, the most skilled, and as a result, he has this arrogance of, well, I can just figure out how to make it work. Well, no, you can't. It's really not that simple. And so he goes down that path. Now, we don't have to look just at the Lord of the Rings to come up with examples for this. We can also look at things like the Baron and Luthien story. Baron is kind of like Aragorn. He's not a weakling. He's not unwise or anything like that. But in the scale of the First Age, at the time that he's living, he's kind of nothing. Uh, he may be mighty among men, but he's still not that much among the High Elves that he's surrounded by. And he's certainly nothing compared to Sauron and all the other evil things that he has to face up against. Nevertheless, he miraculously comes through spider layers and who knows what else he had to go through to get to Doriath. He gets the help of Finrod, who himself is quite powerful, but also recognizes the futility of their situation and is, you know, he, he, he tries to do things the smart way and manages to get them all caught. Baron, of course, doesn't really help much in the situation. And one of the things that I've said before, I think, on this channel is that even though Baron is, in theory, the hero of the story, he accomplishes pretty much nothing in the scheme of things. Uh, he rescues, he saves Luthien from a couple of bad Feanorians, but he doesn't really accomplish a whole lot on his own. Luthien does most of the work for him, but it's from his sheer dogged will of trying to accomplish the goal and it's only when he finally gives in to what you might call fate and lets Luthien come along with him that he finally achieves his goal. And it's, you know, it's an interesting parallel. It's not a perfect parallel, but it's an interesting one. On the flip side, and if you caught the hint I was dropping earlier, you know where I'm going now. Turin. Turin is the exact opposite of what Frodo is. Because Turin very clearly is relying on his own strength, his own wits, and he thinks that he's just going to go out there and do what he has to do, and he's going to take it to Morgoth, he's going to make it so his mom and sister can leave Hithlum and, you know, all this stuff, and every single time he tries to do that, he ends up getting slapped down by Morgoth in some form or fashion. And it's usually because he's so arrogant, he doesn't recognize that he needs to not call attention to himself and his family because it's precisely in doing so that Morgoth manages to find him and then, you know, do more damage to him every single time. You know, he keeps outing himself by, you know, waging open warfare, by, you know, I mean, he builds a bridge from a hidden city over a big giant river, for goodness sake. I mean, can you send a bigger red flag? <laughs> it's... Turin is literally the opposite because he is totally relying on his own, you know, skill set. And when messengers come from Círdan saying that they've gotten word from Ulmo that, oh, by the way, y'all need to calm down over here. You know, scale back, cast down the bridge, hide again, because you're not going to get anywhere with this. He's like... Ah, eh, the Valar don't care about us anyway, why should we listen to him? He is explicitly rejecting any kind of help from what, you know, of any kind of providence whatsoever. So Turin is literally the exact opposite. He has explicitly rejected the things that he should be willing to rely on, and instead is focusing purely on his own situation, his own power, whatever it is, and that's why Turin ends up being the greatest tragedy in, you know, the whole saga is because he screws his life up by being proud and arrogant and, you know, the one fairly good part of his life, and even it's messed up because he's married to his own sister, is when he's not going out and waging open warfare. But by then it's too late because he's already done it enough that Glaurung knows there's something up. And here he comes along and he does it. So Turin manages to kill, kill Glaurung, yeah, through his own skill. And what does he do? He gloats about it and then gets sprayed with venomous blood from Glaurung. And then Glaurung looks at him and he passes out. And then bad things go from there. It's like every time he starts to think too much of himself, he gets creamed in some, you know, whether it's physically or 
spiritually or just his life gets ruined, whatever it is, every single time. So Turin, like I said, is literally the polar opposite. Frodo is our, you know, kind of categorical, you know, example of what this is. This is, you know, him being accepting of what fate has thrown in his lap. He, it takes him a little bit, of course, to accept it because he, he does try to pass it off on to Gandalf and later he tries to pass it off on to Galadriel. But this is a thing that happens. And this there's a sense in which that is even a good instinct, right? Because, and, and I love this part in uh, Prince Caspian where at the end of the story, they've achieved victory and Aslan will ask Caspian, do you feel ready to take up the kingship? And Caspian says, I don't think I am. And Aslan says, good, because if you thought you were, it would be proof that you were not. So the fact that Frodo does not feel ready to do this is proof that, you know, he is at least the right kind of person to take on that role. And so it means that he has the type of humility that he that is going to allow Providence to do its work and achieve what Providence will achieve in its own way. And so Frodo is the perfect person to send on this quest. With, you know, he does have, you know, some measure of wisdom and wit and whatnot. He says he has so little of these things, but by the standard of hobbits, he's actually pretty high up. Nevertheless, much like Baron, he may be pretty good in his own ground, but in the scheme of things, he's nothing. And he recognizes this. He recognizes that in the scheme of this quest, I have nothing to offer. But that's precisely what he does have to offer. He has the fact that he is willing to accept providence and not, you know, think that he can handle everything on his own. So, this, to me, is one of the more beautiful messages that you can take out of Christianity or Tolkien, you know, whichever. But it's the idea that the small and the humble are very often the ones who can do the biggest things because they are not so arrogant as to think that they can make it all work themselves. They are willing to work with what they have, but also to let, you know, higher powers do what they are, you know, trying to accomplish and let the good kind of work itself out in its own way. And that's not to say that you have to be completely passive, of course. Frodo has to make active decisions. He has to do things, but he's not doing them in the, in the sense that, he is like, okay, I am going to use my power and my wisdom and my whatever to accomplish this goal in my way. No, he's like, he has to make decisions from time to time, but he does to a large degree rely on the greater wisdom of others or, you know, what seems to be, you know, the, the direction, the stream of providence is flowing rather than what do I think is just the smartest thing to do. So that is an analysis of how... The power of God, or Eru Iluvatar in this particular instance, is made perfect in weakness. It is literally made perfect in weakness because it is through that weakness that God can show his power in the most pure form. So, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please do give the video a like and a share. Please also subscribe if you want to catch more of my content. If you're on YouTube, make sure you click that bell icon. The other platforms and social links are in the description below as our support links. And don't forget on Twitter, I've dropped Tolkien-related trivia questions on a regular basis. And until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye. Thanks to all my channel supporters, especially Elf Friends P.A. Brew News, Nathan Dufour, and Paul Leone.